Hi, if everyone could take their seats, please, we'd like to get started. Thank you. Um, hi, you've all seen me before. I'm Beth Wenger. I'm the director of the Jewish Studies Program here at Penn. And uh, no, there's, there are other people to applaud. Don't applaud me. Um, uh, for those of, of you who have been with us for even parts of the last two days, you know what an exciting, exhilarating discussion we've had together, which culminates tonight. And my only role here, uh, wait, before I, ha I have one task, please look and see if your cell phones are turned off. And if they are not, please turn them off. Thank you. My role is uh, to introduce the person who's actually doing the introduction, and that is uh, Rebecca Bushnell, who's Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences here at Penn. We're very happy to have Dean Bushnell here. Thank God, that's someone to applaud. Not only because she is the dean for most of us back sitting in this room, but also because she is a scholar of literature herself and an appropriate person in many ways to be here. Rebecca Bushnell. So good afternoon, everyone. So again, I am Rebecca Bushnell. I'm Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences. And it really is my great pleasure to be here today for this final public event of the International Conference on the Light and Work of the Israeli author Aharon Appelfeld. This really has been a tremendous honor for Penn to welcome this literary giant into our midst. And I hope that the last two days have really been a unique opportunity to reflect on the wide-ranging impact of his writings. Now, so when gathering to celebrate and explore a work of great author is certainly a common on, enough act, activity in academia, it is far less common to have the author, him or herself, um, present for these conversations. And so it really has been a privilege for us that Applefeld has been with us for these proceedings, culminating in this afternoon's conversation with him. Aharon Applefeld's body of work, consisting of some 25 novels, novellas, and books of essays and short stories, draws heavily on his own experience as a Holocaust survivor. It's established him not only as a figure of world literature in his own right, but also part of a pioneering generation that has helped to solidify the place of Israel on the world literary landscape in the decades after its founding. Born in Romania, in an area that's now part of the Ukraine, Appelfeld lost his mother to the Holocaust at the age of eight. He escaped a concentration camp and hid in forests for three years, later joining the Soviet army and eventually finding his way to Italy and then Palestine in 1946. There he resumed his formal education as a teenager and studied Hebrew, the language in which he has written ever since. Appelfeld's writings are highly metaphorical in style and while he's most often described by others as an Israeli writer of the Holocaust, he is most likely to describe himself as a Jewish writer whose themes are the uprooted orphans in the war. His work has been honored with a host of top literary prizes as well as with the Israel Prize. He's taught writing at Ben Gurion University of the Negev, Penn's collaborator in presenting this conference. Now for Penn, Applefeld's Prince is particularly meaningful because we are a university that takes great pride in our academic strengths in Jewish studies, in the study of the Holocaust, and of course in the activities of our wonderful Kelly Writers House. So on behalf of the School of Arts and Sciences, I would like to express our gratitude for his presence a little more formally with the presentation of a special gift. So I'd like to call Aharon to come and join me, please, at the podium. And I may call you Aharon, right? <laughs> we know that you've long cited Kafka as your inspiration, and others have often compared your work to his. So what we have for you today is a very special Kafka volume. It's a 1935 edition of his unfinished novel, America, a title that, of course, connects his work with your visit here. It's in the German, okay, which is both your and Kafka's mother tongue, and the time and the circumstances of this publication place it at the historical crossroads on which you yourself stand in your work. Now, I've also been reliably informed that while Kafka is Aharon's favorite author, Kafka himself signaled out as his favorite book, the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin, often reading it out loud. And Franklin, of course, is Penn's founder and great inspiration. So our own, we hope this volume will symbolize, if only indirectly, the intellectual ties that bind you not only to Kafka, but also to the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you so much for being with us this week. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. 
So with that, I'm going to turn the program over to Neely Gold, one of the organizers of this conference who will lead a conversation with Aharon. Neely is an associate professor and a distinguished scholar of modern Hebrew literature in our Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. So Neely. Thank you so much, Dean Bushnell, for coming and introducing Aaron for us. Uh, uh, it is a rare professional opportunity for a scholar and teacher of a literature written so far away to have a conversation with Aaron Appelfeld, the author she so loves and admires. Having this conversation at Penn is, is a culmination of a two-day conference in honor of the life of, and work of Aaron Appelfeld. Scholars from Israel, France, the West Coast, and the East Coast of the United States gathered here at the University of Pennsylvania to pay homage to his monumental oeuvre. Um, I, we actually hope to have a book, to have a volume of the uh, conference where all the lectures, including the upcoming conversation, will be published. Before this conversation, I would like to thank each and every one of the wonderful lecturers, presenters who took part uh, in the conference. I, I want to express my deepest and heartfelt gratitude to Professor Beth Wenger, the Director of Jewish Studies, who worked with me on this project from its inception. Many, many thanks go also to Professor Al Filris, who opened his arms and his heart and his Kelly Writer's house uh, to us. Uh, and the to, and the to, to the University Research Foundation and the schools of, uh, School of Arts and Sciences and the many departments and programs that supported us. And as well as the, uh, I see the consul here, the Israeli consulate uh, in Philadelphia who supported us. Uh, this conference is a product of a collaborative effort with Ben-Gurion University and its Heksherim Institute for Research of Hebrew Culture. Yigal Schwartz, the director of this uh, institute, uh, my dear friend and colleague, uh, an Appelfeld scholar and editor, uh, carried a very significant part of the responsibility for this event. I also want to, to thank Nicola, especially for his, uh, for his help. And uh, last but not least, Chrissy Walsh and Ravit Levine, who worked tirelessly on every detail on both sides of the ocean. So now it's, um, it's a very rare and um, coveted place for me to sit right next to Aaron Appelfeld. So, um, can you hear me? Yeah. Um, so, when I told uh, Aaron's, uh, Aaron Appelfeld's wife that I'm very nervous before this, she said, "Don't worry. He, he will, he will say, he, he will, he will help you. He will be there." <laughs> so, um, so the first question I uh, wanted to ask you is that uh, in your writings, childhood always appears as this pure, beautiful island that nothing can touch it. Uh, even your characters who are murderers, who are criminals, uh, when they remember their childhood, suddenly there is this calm area where they, uh, where they, that they inhabit. I wanted to ask what are the autobiographical parts of that island and how do you forge it? How do you manage to um, interject it to each one of your works, sometimes in a sentence, sometimes in a paragraph, sometimes in, in one more? But what is, what is the real island that, that you're referring to? 
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. You know, immediately I have a real question, <laughs> a tough question. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. You know, I'm just, I was not in America for the last 10 years. I was not in America. And, uh, and now when I'm here, I have a feeling that it's good to be in America. You feel, you feel a kind of freedom in America. You do not feel in Europe. Maybe because I'm Jewish. Uh, it's, uh, it gets a good feeling, a warm feeling, yes. And I'm very grateful to, to our, my friends who came to attend. You know, all of them wonderful scholars, brilliant scholars. Uh, but for me, they are friends. So, uh, it's, so it's wonderful to meet them again here in this place, uh, to hear their voices, to be close to them. Yes. This is, now I'm going to relate to your, to your question. I, you can see, I was born many years ago. <laughs> many, many years ago in a town named Chernowitz. And this was a really a very beautiful, a small town between East and West Europe. A very charming town. 50, between 50 and 60 percent of the population were Jewish. Yes. A town with a lot of assimilated Jews. I'm coming from a very assimilated Jew, yes. But the town by itself, a lot of schools, two Latin gymnasium, high schools, yes, they call it gymnasium, a large university, and most of the Jews living there attended, of course, the schools the Latin schools and the university. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's a very European, it was a very European town with a bit of the smell of the East, of the Slavic countries, yes, Ruthenians. The population were uh, Jews, Ruthenians, Romanians, <laughs> and all kind of all kind of small nations, Hutsulim, all kind of all. So it's a multi language, you know, region. I was born to as I've said, you I was born to a, to a family. I was the only son, very spoiled. Very spoiled. And I used to spend a lot with my parents on vacations. We used to travel to, to our grandparents who were living in the Carpathians. Yesterday, oh, yesterday, yes, you have seen the film about my visit to the Carpathians, my grandfather's home. Um, so we used to walk a lot, to meet a lot of people. Uh, Chernovitz is, you know, it was a very warm home. The streets were very warm, yes. This was until 41, when the German entered and immediately there was a ghetto and we are pushed into the ghetto. And then to the railway station, we are pushed to the railway station. I lost my mother at the beginning of the war. She was killed. I remained with my father. So we were pushed into these cattle trains uh, to the east, to the east, to the Ukraine. And we came to a small camp, this 41. The fences were not electrified before. So I was separated from my father. 
and I was eight and a half years old. So I was there, people were dying, starving and dying, and I was alone. And I've decided that I will go under the fence and run away. I was lucky. I had a round face with blonde hair. You cannot see the, can you see the blonde hair? <laughs> blonde hair, blue eyes. And another thing, I was, I was fluent in the Ukrainian language because the mates in our home, they were Ukrainians. So I was with them. So it was, uh, you know, it, there it ended, you know, in 41, ended a wonderful childhood. You know, I adored my parents and still adore them. I still live with them, still with them. Uh, so this was, and then I went, you know, in the forest, it was a forest. And I went from place to place to ask some work. Why, you know, it was a danger, of course, to, to go from place to place. No one wanted me. So at the end of the mountains, uh, I have seen a hut. <coughs> so I went there, knocked on the door. And a young, beautiful woman opened the door. And I said to her, you know, I've lost my parents. I'm alone. I've not told her that I'm Jewish, of course. I'm alone. Can you give me shelter? I will work with you. Yes, come in. So uh, what, what it striked me was the room. Her room, it was one room actually, full of pictures. She took them out from the journals. Beautiful boys, beautiful girls, decorated one room. So my work was to go to the village. This was outside the village. To go to the village, to buy products, to clean the home. And I was with her. In the evening, huge, a huge peasant came into this hut. Yes, they made a bit of love. And, uh, and then suddenly they were in the bed and they were all kind of things. I am coming from a, you know, very bourgeois family, you know. You kiss, but very carefully, not the way the, pe the Ukrainian peasant is kiss kissing. And, uh, so, so this she was. Let me say she was. Yeah, she was working for the village. A lot. The, the villagers used to come every night. One, two, sometimes three. It was always calm, but sometimes she was furious when the peasant said she, that he does, has forgotten his money. Then she became furious, very furious. So this was my first, you know, entering into the world. At home I finished my first grade. And this was the second grade. <laughs> this was the, my second grade. This was my second grade. In the evenings, in, when it became very cold, in the evenings when it became very cold, so we used to sit together and talk. I don't know what she thought about me because she probably understood that I'm not Ukrainian. Once she said to me, you know, I was born in a town of Kashinev. And my lovers were Jewish students. They know how to love a woman, not like those horses, these peasants, you know. They know, they are always bringing me chocolates, all kind of beautiful presents, you know. 
they kiss me gently. These were my lovers in, in, in Kishinev. So I was tempted to say to her, you know, I'm Jewish too. <laughs> <laughs> but I restrained myself, <laughs> you know, so this was a real secret that I should keep, uh, you know. So I spent with her, and I must say, this was frightful moments, very frightful moments, this, this, huge, this huge peasant, because it was one room, to see them naked, you know. So this was, a, this was quite a frightful situation. And I was with her, and I was with her, and uh, I cleaned the home, I, I brought her products. And so it began a new life of him. I understood that outside the Ukrainian village, outside the Ukrainian village, there is, you know how to say, kind of a colony of the prostitute witches, invalids, insane people, and all kind, you know, of invalids, a lot of invalids, and a lot of criminals, too. This were a group, it's like a colony with hats. They were living together, drinking a lot, playing cards. Uh, the criminals need mainly, a, they need children, and they need dogs. So I was children. Just to say, uh, Nelly, forgive me, because I'm just to understand what, uh, you know, people do not know me. I don't know how many people have read my books. Uh, so this is a kind of, I grew up, you know, the way I grew up. And, uh, and I was with her for a couple of months. And then a huge peasant turned to me and said to me, so what are you doing here, dirty Jew? So I understood this is the end. This, this is the end. I do not know who planted in my head to say to him, to say to him, how do you dare to say to a Christian boy that he is Jewish? I think my grandfather planted into me this sentence, you know, it's not my wisdom, of course it was. And he left me. You know, it was... But I understood that I have to move. If someone has an eye on you, you have to move, you have to move. So I spent for two and a half years with all kinds of criminals, all kinds of criminals. Horse stealers, no, woman stealers, just murders, all kinds of, you know, people who are, who are living in the margin of the society. And because they were, they became, they were more and more criminals, you know. So this was my school where I spent after a very warm childhood in my home. Maybe because my warm childhood, I could overcome it. Yes. And the childhood, now I'm coming back, you know, to your guy. My childhood was a very warm home, very Jewish assimilated home, but very delicate, a lot of music, a lot of warm discussions, a liberal, very liberal home. My two uncles were communists. This was small pain, you know, devoted to devoted communists. And, uh, and my grandparents, 
both religious people. We used to visit them in the, you know, the summer vacations, we used to visit them. And both of them, both my parents, they were quiet people. They were farmers, quiet people. Uh, their behavior were very delicate, you know. They were religious, deeply religious, but without, you know, outside effects. The way, the way they touched objects. At the to lunch, my grandfather used to come from the fields, clean his hands, a small prayer, studying for an hour. After studying and praying, the meal, there was a meal. But always very, very, and I remember near his home because it, it was quite isolated. There were no Jews around. And he had a small synagogue his own synagogue, uh, a wooden synagogue, a small, the smell, it still I smell it, you know, the wood. And in the Saturdays, Jews from all kinds were collect. They came there to pray. For me, it was always a wonder, people are praying. In Chernowitz, people have forgotten to pray. No one prayed more, you know. There were, of course, a lot of synagogues. But we came from, my parents were assimilated Jews. I want to so, sorry, for the so short question, such a long answer. You were talking about the first grade and then the second grade. And uh, a part of the education, of first grade education and second grade education, is the language. Um, I asked you about the language you spoke with the criminals and the prostitute, but I wanted one of the most moving sentences of yours, and a lot of your sentences are very moving for me, but. but uh, specifically one, and I'm going to uh, translate it not according to the, um, I'm going to translate it with my own, you know, my own attempt. Uh, you say, the language of my mother and my mother became one. And now, referring to the time when uh, Appelfeld arrived in Israel, uh, and now, as the German language was slowly extinguished in me, I felt that my mother is again dying for me. So you, you feel for a minute, yes, this, this knowledge of, of the death of the mother and the death of the language. And yet the sentence immediately after that is, it was clear to me as day that if I meet her, I will speak German with her, the language that I spoke from the time I was born. And I wanted to ask you about that. Um, and, and I feel the same way, you know, the Ger German, uh, everybody says German, you know, like, how do you, how do you like it so much? You know, it's the language of the murderers, but no, it's my mother tongue. Um, or at least I didn't speak it, but my parents spoke it. I heard, uh, and when I hear Appelfeld's voice and even the, the lilt in it, it's very reminiscent of the, of the German I heard uh, as a child, as this music of it. And, and I understand exactly what you were saying. And yet you became a master of your tuozo, as they uh, said in the New York Times, of the Hebrew language. Um, what happened to the German language? Did it continue extinguishing? Did it continue flourishing once you felt better about your Hebrew? And how do you feel about German now? And what do you feel when you speak German now and when you hear German now? Again, a tough question. <laughs> um, uh, you see, my first language was German. And this was not a German German. It was a Jewish German. 
because it was not in the center. It was on the border between east and west. And it was somewhere Judaized. You know, the German became more. It's, therefore, it, it's a very soft German, very soft German. As Kafka spoke and has written this kind of Austro-Hungarian Jewish German. Uh, and I used, you know, I loved to listen to my wa mother's voice. Uh, it was a soft voice. And I used to, every evening before going to sleep, she used to tell me stories. Yes, reading some stories from a book. Yes. And this was a festive moment. Yes. Uh, so I, I, so the German language was with me, but in the wartime, I spoke Ukrainian and Russian, and I had a different name. At home, my name was Erwin, but in the forest with the criminals, it was Yannick. So I had another name, another language. I grew up with them, you know, eight and a half, Nine and a half, ten and a half, twelve and a half. So uh, I grew up with those people, and I must say I absorbed them. Because you see, it was wonderful. I, I, I went through the villages looking for work. No one wanted to accept me. But the criminals accept me, the invalids accept me, the peasants will ask me all kinds of questions. Who are you? Why are you here? Where are your parents? Uh, but the criminals accepted me. So this was for me, I must say, I must admit it. And this was for me the school of observation. I have learned to observe people to look at them, are they dangerous? Will they give me a piece of bread? Will they say to me a good word? And this was an obsession. Another rule I had in my, in my behavior, not to speak, to listen, but not to speak, not to ask questions, the world's sake. All the duties they have, I have done it but not ask a question. <laughs> uh, just to give you an example, I was with a group of horse stealers. Horse stealers, good, yes. Horse stealers, horse yeah. Thieves. Horse thieves, good. So they used to elevate me and to push me through these small windows into into the stable, in the darkness, in the midnight. And then to collect the horses, and they were not quiet when he, in the midnight when you touch a horse, so he's not quiet, and he can be quite dangerous, to open the door and take them out. This was my. So I have done it quite a lot. You know, and uh, I became so the horse thieves. They were. Uh, I've learned a lot about horses, <laughs> about stealing horses, <laughs> the way you steal them. Because horses, I used to go back to. You know, you have to bound them in different ways. I have a diploma. <laughs> Uh, so I, I uh, this was, but not to speak, to listen, to observe. After the war, I was dumb. I could not say a word. I was dumb. The muscles here, I could not open my mouth. It was for a couple of months until I could open my mouth. The language, I was confused about it, you know. 
I've actually in these years I've forgotten my German. It came back to me later in Israel. I've forgotten it, you know, because I wanted so much to look Ukrainian and to speak U Ukrainian, to speak Russian, that I have somewhere repressed my mother language. And only in Israel, years, it came back to me. How, how did it come back to you? Where, it came back to me because the first, I, you know, Because I, you speak about how, ye, how Yiddish came to you at the university, but German didn't come at the university. Yeah, no, so no, how, was, how did you how recover started. German? I recovered German because I was in a kibbutz. After the war, I came as a group of orphans to a kibbutz, to a farm, to a kibbutz. In this farm, in this kibbutz, I, we were working in the fields. And in the afternoons, we were studying some Hebrew, some Bible. But I had a hunger to read a book. It came from my home. My parents, they used to read every evening. I had a hunger for it. And so I, there were some books in the library, German books. So I began to read them. Yes. So because I could not, my Hebrew was not sufficient to read, so German was a very good. Idea. So it came back to me through reading books. So you read Kafka in German? No, this or? is not. Kafka came very late, you know. These were all in the kibbutz books that that the immigrants brought with them to the world. This is very late. So it was another, you know, bringing back my home. The, the several books I had there, it brought me back home. And how do you feel about German now? You see, I, I have never cultivated the German language. I read German. And I love especially Kafka, that I, it's, uh, that I read them. But not only Kafka, yes. yes. But Kafka has this Austro-Hungarian, yes. uh, very easy German, actually. Yes. Or, or, not, or easy. not easy, but, but kind of yes. not Baroque. Not, no, not, not Thomas Mann, no. Yeah. 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 Um, it's short. Um, I wanted to ask you because it's um, it's interesting because a part a part of this question you answered indirectly, but I I wanted to ask you because uh, for a while for a long time you had this uh, reputation or image of a writer who is very withheld and very controlled, uh, who writes in metaphors, doesn't write directly about horrible things. Um, everything is very kind of uh, hinted at, uh, suggested. And then suddenly, about 20 years ago, uh, these books started appearing with protagonists who are murderers. And not just murderers, but uh, a woman who, who cut up the man with a small knife. She cut up a man who she killed to 24 pieces. Um, I mean, she had a good reason. He killed her baby, but, but uh, she did that, and that was Katerina. And after Katerina, uh, through the book that just appeared in, that was reviewed in the New York Times, that just appeared in English, uh, Till, Dawn, uh, Till Dawn's Light, you have another woman murderer who killed her husband with an ax, and he's fleeing. And in the latest book that came out in Hebrew, Mighty Water, which is not yet translated, again, we have a man who finds out that his brother and his family were murdered, and he sets out to solve, to decipher, find out who was the killer, and kill him. Uh, and um, these killers, these very sometimes brutal killers, 
um, fill these uh, almost dramatic plots, uh, almost mystery, like almost mystery novels. And I wanted to ask you, who are those people? Where are they? Are they new metaphors? Are they people you actually encountered? Uh, are they a fruit of your imagination? Where, where is that? Is that a new? Is that a new strategy to get to a similar end? Or I understand. A pity I cannot invite Freud. You know, Sigmund <laughs> Freud. I should invite him. You know, he should help me. <laughs> you know. Let me begin. I came to Israel. I was 13 and a half years old. I was in a farm in a kibbutz, studying some Hebrew. In 46, in the 40s, and even in the 50s, Israel was a very ideological country, socialist, ideological country, a very heroic country. People who came after the Holocaust to Israel, about 700,000 Jews who came up, who survived the Holocaust and came to Israel. And they could not speak about, they were not, not it, they could not speak about their experience. Partisans, fighters, they were allowed to speak. But normal people, who just suffered, just survived. They were not allowed to speak about it. So my generation and I, so we repressed our memories of the Holocaust, and not only of the Holocaust. So we, we built here a cellar. You see, in this area, we built a cellar. So you see, I'm still inviting Freud to help me, yes. We repressed our memories. We repressed our parents who passed away, the, our grandparents. We repressed our language, mother language, and we adopted a new language, a Hebrew language. But this was something on the surface, because here inside was the real life. This was the real life. But you could not use your real life. Yes? On the surface, you are young, you are working in the fields, then you attend the army. But inside, there was another world. There was not any connection between the outside and the inside. It took me a while to understand, you know, my generation, all of them. And this was a tragedy for young people who came to Israel. They, rep they repressed their memories, not pleasant memories, to be in a ghetto and in a camp, and, and seeing your dying parents, and so on. This was not, so it's no wonder they, they repressed it. For different reasons, I could not repress. In my dreams, even in, in the daydreams, I was with my parents. I was in, the, in my town because I felt the kind that I'm an orphan, a lost orphan. And one thing I have done one night after the meals have been served in the kibbutz, I sat down and made a list. Mother Bunya, Father Michael, Grandfather Joseph. I 
was living in a town of Chernowitz. I was living in a street, the Masaryk Street. So I made a list. And the list was somewhere in, a, you know, I could not spell it so well in Hebrew, but still I've done it, this list in Hebrew. I have still this list. And this gave me a feeling that I have a home. I'm not a lost person. I'm not an orphan. I have something around me. I have parents. This list. And I, you know, treasured this list. was looking all the time. Because it was a fear I'm going to to forget them. I'm going to forget their language, their way of life. I'm going to be some creature, tall, blonde, with blue eyes. This was somewhere a Zionist fantasy about the new Jew, the tall Jew. I could not be a tall Jew because <laughs> I could not be a blonde Jew, yes. And so... But how do, how do those murderers fit into this? Is this? This is the first stage. It's before writing. So my first book was actually, if you wish, a collection of stories that I have written when I was somewhere 23, 24 years old, I was studying it because you know, it's, I fragmentized what I said, you know. I began to study, I was in the university. I began to open the cellar. I began to write. And the first book of stories was a kind of outcry a huge outcry. I cannot forget them. Because the slogan in the 40s and the 50s, sometimes they're written and not written, you know. A slogan was forget, become a new Jew. I could not forget. And this was an hour, I remember, it was the first story I've written, the name is Berta. This is the first story, it's about a young, a young man who on his way to Israel found a small girl. A, a, a girl, an invalid, a mute, just a small creature. And he wanted to get all the time rid of this, kid, of this small girl, but, this, but he could not do it. He wanted to send her away on the way. He could not do it. And then he came to Israel with her. He wanted to, se to send her to, to, a, to an institution, but he hasn't done it. So this was somewhere a deep feeling you cannot get, and this was my feeling, I cannot get rid. They are with me. Not only the parents, but all the people I have seen in the ghetto, and all the people that I was with them in, in the camp, and all the people who were wandering after the war with me. I could not get rid of them, they were with me. And therefore, I've written. And you know, it's, uh, you call it quiet stories, yes? It's not so quiet, then, stories. No, I didn't say quiet. I said, I mean, suggestive. They're not, they're not as forthcoming. You, you know, you have some of those suggestive sentences even in your later book, you know, like, yeah. Uh, in in uh, Till Dawn's Light, I, I showed my yeah. student this amazing sentence where yeah. you say uh, th this woman and her son are fleeing 
and you describe this pastoral landscape and you say the carps were swimming in the pool, ignoring that a danger was awaiting them, was lurking there. And you're only talking about the carps, of okay. course, you know. So, uh, so you never left this suggestive tone, but, but the deeds of your, you know, Berta that you're talking yeah. about and the man who wants to desert her and your other characters are all calmer or more introverted characters, while characters like Katerina or Blanca or Issachar are very, you know, they actually carry out the revenge or, you know, if, I mean, you kind of answered it, they come out of the cellar and they do whatever they do. Yes, so we are slowly approaching, we are slowly approaching. <laughs> so this was the first, the first phase was a kind of outcry. I cannot change myself. I'm only what I am. And this was, for a young man, something of an opposition. This was an opposition. Because when I first came with my first book to a publisher, he said, Appelfeld, how old are you? 25? And you are going to write about refugees who came to Israel? And your refugees who are coming to Israel, they are living on the, sh they are not going to a kibbutz, they are living on the shore, playing cards, drinking vodka, smuggling all kinds of things, what they have done in the ghetto and in the camps, and then on the, the way to Israel, they are continuing to do it on the shore of Tel Aviv. So, Applefeld, this is what you are going to write for us. You should write positive things, like the kibbutz. <laughs> you should be a positive man, and not with this degenerated people. You are, who, who drink vodka and all kind of women, you know, dubious women. So, it, no one wanted to publish this book. No one wanted. I found a Bukharian boy, a young boy, who I was with him in the army. And he asked me, you know, I was with my, you know, with my first book, you know. And I was, uh, so he told me, what do you have here? Yeah, you know, I have written a book of stories. But all the people are saying, all the editors are saying, it's a bad, it's a bad book. So Baruch, his name was his Baruch who could not read, who could not write, said to me, you know, we have a Bukharian tradition that a man with soft eyes can only do good deeds. Yes, maybe, but good deeds is not enough for good writing. Then he told me, so, you know, I, you, I used to write for him letters to the income tax office. <laughs> and he trusted me very much about those letters. And I used to copy them and rewrite them and copy them and rewrite them. And he loved me because he was quite a wealthy man. He, he, had a, he owned a big store in the market, and, uh, and he felt a kind of affinity to me, you know. So I told him, you know, this is the situation. So he, he told me, you know, I cannot believe that you are writing bad. But the people, you know, Good editors, famous editors, are saying that. So you said, you know, I have seen you, how you are copying. You are copying every word. And you are so precise in your writing. I cannot believe that you are writing well. 
And then he came to a suggestion. You know, Aaron, I have a suggestion. I have a brother-in-law who has a kind of uh, a type, uh, you know. And I'm going to him, and I will publish your book. And, you know, I will make with you a small contract. And I will give you 500 pounds. And you will give me your manuscript. So I said, Baruch, you are giving me good money, and I'm giving you a bad manuscript. You know, this is something, it cannot be our friends. I cannot do it with you. Don't worry, I'm not poor, he said to me. So he convinced me and gave me 500 pounds. And I was just finished my studies in the university, a poor student. And here I have 500 pounds. This was like a god. $5,000, a huge sum. I have never earned such, such, a, such a sum. So we made a contract. I'm giving you the <laughs> manuscript, and you are giving me 500. So I could not sleep at night. So I, I came in the midnight to him and said, Baruch, I cannot, you know, you gave me 500 pounds, and, and I give you a bad manuscript. No, it's not a bad manuscript. It's a wonderful manuscript. Have you read it? No. <laughs> <laughs> but I trust you, you know, I trust you. So this was a kind, uh, so if you wish, take it. You know, I, I'm not forcing you. So, but I will publish the book, and he has published the book. It's, it's a more complicated story, even this other, but I made it short. <laughs> I made it short. So he published the book, and then he put it in a van somewhere in his home, got it, a van, 500 copies. And he said, you know, I told him, you have published 500 copies. You should distribute them in the shops, bookshops. So he said to me, so we in Bukhara, we have a tradition that books will bring us luck. Yes, you mean holy books, not, not the trash that I'm writing, you know. <laughs> holy books, yes, they will bring life, you know. Put the Bible, yes, all kind of holy books. The prayer book, but not what I'm writing. This guy. So he said to me, you know, this is the way I feel about it, you know. So it was, a, I came to him to, he gave me every, every Friday, he gave me five copies, and I distributed them in the shops. Thank you. Um, you talk about... It's not the oh, end, it's oh, not sorry. the end of the story. <laughs> <laughs> it's not the end of the story. <laughs> this is, was my first book, but I remember your questions. You know, <laughs> you said his, the first books were so, you know, delicate. What is the I other said you book? had an image of that. Uh, yeah. Yes, <laughs> they were so delicate. But then, you know, there came another period I have written. I wanted to know who I am, who are my parents. I left them when I was, you know, I was, my mother was killed and I was separated from my father. So actually, what do I know about them? The books like Badenheim, Age of Wonders, these were the books exploring, exploring my parents, the simulated Jew, all what they call, sometimes Critics would say, oh, Appelfeld is against assimilated Jews. No, it's not against assimilated Jews. I was a assimilated Jew. I loved my parents. They were Europeans, and I liked them, and still liked them very much. 
this was. But then this was, um, this, this was the books that I have written about, about my assimilated background. But then underneath this, there was another layer. There were my grandparents, my uncles who were communist, and the maids who were working in our home. So this was more of a mythological material. Because this is kind of, you know, crazy communist, a young, uh, young mates. I was quite a nice young boy, and they used to hug me and kiss me and bite me. <laughs> and this young, this young maids, and mother would say to him, Katerina, you have done it to the boy. Why have you done this to the boy? And she would say, oh, what can I do? I love him. This was a ramp. Uh, so it was in a, in a mythological. So when you are in the rhyme of the mythological, it's a different way of writing. So you're saying it's a move in your writing. It's a different. You move to a different realm, a realm. within it's within a, your writing. It's a different move, but it's more a mythological. You know. okay. And. Uh, so, of course, uh, it's not a different apple field. The same, but a writer cannot change. But a writer cannot it's change. A move, it's a move, it's within the same apple field, but it's a move in a, in a direction a that different is. Different direction, yes. It's not, it's because you do it in a different, it's not you, you're changing your character. They are the same. All of them, they are the same. Because it's not that, that I'm, I'm not, do not write characters. I do not write characters. It's an extension of myself. All the women, all the children, all the men, all the women, they are an extension of me. I do not pretend to write characters. You know, I do not pretend. You know. I, have, I have a couple of questions that actually um, uh, my students asked me to ask you. Good. Um, what? So, um, so one, it, it, it's interesting. You said that your name in the forest was Yannick. Yeah. And uh, we read the story, The Hunt. And, uh, and of course, it's Yannick. And then we read the, at Kelly Ryder's house yesterday, chapter nine in, in the story of a life. And it, the, the closeness was very striking. And my students who from, from both the English and Hebrew classes wanted to know why you sometimes describe people as animals. What is the, the um, uh, specifically the question was about the hunt when the Jews are uh, described as, as birds and in, um, even in the, in the story of a life when it's supposedly a, something that really happened, that little, that little thing that, that ran in the cornfield was like a fish or like a little, um, so, so what, what is the move? And uh, another question they asked. Um, well, this is one question. Okay, yeah. this is one, okay, go ahead. That's it. You see, it's very strange that, you know, that, you know, in a world I was, a world, a, a world of catastrophe. A world where people were killing. A, a world of animals, 
I spoke about horses, but I haven't spoken about the dogs, because the horses and the dogs became closer to me than the people. I used to sleep with the horses from one side and a dog from the other side. So they became close to me. I felt the warmth in the cold days when I was close to them, but not to the human beings. So animals, you know, sometimes... It's out of affection. Yes. That you. Yes, something that so, I. It, so the people who you loved, yes, you, you described I, as animals. Somewhere I could not trust those animals. Somewhere I could not trust other people. I could the trust animal. the dog. I could trust the horse, but not people. Uh, I want just. Uh, I think we have to. Uh, we have time for. Uh, okay, so. A question that you, um, I never heard the answer to actually, and my students asked. Uh, how did you meet your father? Because your father survived. Yes. And um, what happened, it, and it, we know it was in Israel, but we don't know much about the circumstances. I was separated from my father in 41. I have met him in 58, so, you know, 18, 17, 80 years. And uh, he was in a German camp, and the Russian army liberated the camp and forced them, forced him, and mobilized him in the Russian army. So, and he was in the Russian army. Then he went, they took him back to Russia. It's only after it was years he could get out. And then he came to Israel. And all those years you didn't know he was no, alive? No, no, no. So, so there was a gap. But it was very important to meet my father. You know, because I, I could. I took my memory that was so weak, give me more solid ground. So how did you find him? An old man. He was not so old, but he was old. And then he was in Israel, began to work. And he was, uh, he was quite a character, strong character. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So did he look for you, or did you look for him? Uh, I, you know, in Israel you have every every month or sometimes two weeks list of newcomers, and I've seen his name, and I was not sure that this is my father. Um, okay, my. A couple of other questions. One is, uh, what is your relationship to American literature? Do you have uh, writers who you like in particular, um, feel close to in particular? You see, I have, I like, I began to read Hemingway. His dry style, I found very close. You know, I learned a lot about it. Factual, you know. Factual that he somewhere acquired through his journalism. From the other side, a different type, Faulkner, that he loved to read and still read. And and Melville, you know, Moby Dick. This is a M Moby Dick, Moby Dick. But I adore the Jewish writers in America. 
Such a they were a good, a wonderful model for me. Uh, I have met Malmut in Israel before he died, passed away. I have met Saul Bello, and we used to speak Yiddish because his first language, his first language was Yiddish. And a good friend, Philip Roth. Yes. This was, this was people that I, uh, with Malmut, I spent a couple of days in Israel. Um, and here is sitting a writer, Leslie Epstein, that I spent with him many days, wonderful days, in, in Boston. I even taught in his classes. And uh, I have read, when I have met him, I have read his The King of Jews and other, and his um, other books. And and the last question, we have so many young students here. And I wanted to know, and you wanted to know, if you wise, not all, but very wise Israeli writer, do you have a message for them? Is there something that you want them to take, these young American students, is there something you want them to take with them? Is there something you want to tell them? It's very interesting. The word message doesn't cross my mind. This is not a word I use. So do you have so something no. to tell them that you yes, would like I'm to not, tell them? Yes, this is not my way. You know, I'm coming up in the morning, drinking a cup of, co of coffee, and I'm writing. I'm writing. I'm writing at least for four hours. I'm trying to write clean sentences. Sentences you can understand, reasonable. So my work is somewhere polishing, cleaning. And this I'm doing. And in the afternoon, after I have written what I have written, I'm editing again, taking out mainly sentences. So, eh, at the end of the day, when I have a clean page, I do not use a computer, when I have a clean page, I'm so happy. You see, it's just a clean page. What does it mean, you know, sometimes I have a feeling that I write for a friend. Yes, that I write for a friend. That I want to give him something of myself. Well, you do. Yes. Uh, sometimes it's not a friend, but some people who I've met, that I want them to give them a gift, myself, something of myself. So I do not believe in great, in great messages. Do not believe in great messages. I believe in warmth and being able to understand some people, being able to give something of yourself. Uh, to share some intimacy and not uh, you know, I know that in our days a lot of writers uh, became politicians. This is, imagine Bach, a politician.